afternoon, Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon, Tobago. Specifically, I am Dr. Faith B. Israel, and I am the Minority Counselor in the Tobago House of Assembly. I am here this afternoon because we are trying to do this differently. Of course, with COVID-19, we have to do these remote um, press briefings. So we are asking the members of the media, they have already joined, or many of them have joined a Zoom meeting that we have. And after I have done making my presentation, they will be able to ask their questions via the Zoom media. There are three things I would like to touch on particularly today. The first thing relates to the core, the first thing relates to having several patients, those with COVID-19 and those without COVID-19 being held at the same facility. The second issue deals with transportation of COVID-19 patients between Trinidad and Tobago. And the third issue treats with testing of COVID-19 patients. It's important to know Trinidad and Tobago that we are in a different time. We are in the midst of a crisis, and because we are in the midst of a crisis, we need to ensure that we bring all hands on deck to help us treat with COVID-19. Throughout the rest of the world, we see individuals pulling their best and their brightest because that is what it takes to fight this virus. In Tobago, we are calling on the Tobago House of Assembly. We are calling on the Tobago Regional Health Authority. We are calling on the Division of Health, Wellness, and Family Development to please reach out to all of the individuals who are in Tobago, who are from Tobago, who love Tobago, to be a part of this response. Because if we do not respond to this collectively, coherently, and do it correctly the first time, we will not get a second time around. As a result of that, it was extremely interesting, or it was extremely disappointing, when I heard the chief medical officer of the Ministry of Health in Trinidad speak about the fact that they are categorically not treating COVID-19 patients in main health facilities. What does that mean? He categorically said that because we have such a threat of cross-infection, because we have such a threat of nosocomial infections, meaning hospital-acquired infections, it is irresponsible and it goes against most protocols to treat COVID-19 patients in the same facility where you are treating non-COVID-19 patients. After hearing him say that, it took me back to last Friday at the media tour of our health facilities in Tobago, where our acting medical chief of staff spoke about the fact that we were in fact going to use the Scarborough General Hospital to treat COVID-19 positive patients who require medical assistance. Of course, we know that up to 80% of the COVID-19 possible positive patients do not necessarily require medical intervention. But that means that a further 20% requires some intervention. And in some instances, 7 to 10% require intense medical intervention. So when they said last Friday that the well COVID-19 patients would be taken up to the old hospital, but the not well COVID-19 patients would be taken to the new hospital, it was cause for concern. And it was absolutely critical that we in Tobago follow all of the guidelines that are said by the Minister of Health and that are put there by the CMO in Trinidad. Now, this is greater than what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago, because we now have an opportunity, Trinidad and Tobago, to ensure that we do not make the same mistakes that many other people have made. For example, I would like to highlight specifically some comments that were made coming out of Italy. 
We all know that in Italy, Italy has been extremely badly hit with COVID-19. For many weeks, the, the death rates in Italy and the positive rates in Italy were extremely high. Coming out of that, they had several lessons that we could have learned from Italy. As a matter of fact, the vice premier of Lombardy, and Lombardy is a region in Italy, and his name is Mr. Carlo Borghetti. Mr. Carlo Borghetti said, and I would like to quote him specifically, he said, the biggest mistake we made was to admit patients infected with COVID-19 into hospitals throughout the region. He went on to further state, we should have immediately set up separate structures exclusively for people sick with coronavirus. I recommend, and this is him speaking, I recommend the rest of the world do this. Do not send COVID-19 patients into healthcare facilities that are still uninfected. This is why I am sure the CMO this week categorically stated that we will not be sending any COVID-19 patients into any of our main health facilities, which is why they have set up COVA and they have set up CORA to take COVID-19 patients. As a result of that, it is extremely difficult for me to understand why in Tobago we would choose to go against all of the best practices, all of the international protocols, all of the hindsight is 2020 that we have gotten from other countries. As a result, I am asking our leaders here in Tobago to critically, critically, critically review that plan to have sick COVID-19 patients housed at our Scarborough General Hospital. As we all know, it is the only hospital we have in Tobago. And we have to ensure that our patients who are not COVID-19 positive patients can be taken care of and can be safely taken care of. For what, what we have recognized and what they've noticed in Italy, for example, is that when you have COVID-19 patients and non-COVID-19 patients in the same facility, the section with COVID-19 patients, those sections tend to not have nosocomal infections, meaning hospital-acquired infections. Why is that the case? Because they really, really are very careful with their PPEs they ensure that they follow all of the rules and follow all of the regulations, follow all of the protocols as it relates to treating with COVID-19 patients. If non-COVID-19 patients are also in the same hospital though, they've recognized that the infection rates in the non-COVID-19 section of the hospital is extremely high. And this is because the rules that we use, our infection control rules, tend to not be as great in the non-COVID-19 areas compared to the COVID-19 areas. And as a result, they have experienced significant, significant levels of nosocomal infections or hospital acquired infections in those non-COVID-19 sections of the hospital. That is why we have said, and that is why I am strongly, strongly recommending that we critically review that plan. Other options, we may not necessarily need to reinvent the wheel at this point. We have the Moriah Health Center that is a relatively new structure that has not been used just yet. We can possibly think of using that Moriah Health Center retrofitted somehow to house our COVID-19 patients. The good thing about using that as a possible option is that where that is situated, there is a large field that is also available just in case we have so many patients that it would overflow the health center capacity. We can then create these tent hospitals, and I'm sure we've all seen these tent hospitals in New York and other places where they've basically put up huge tents. They've had beds, they've had uh, uh, beds, they've had other necessary equipment, ventilators, 
ventilators, for example, to use in those patients. And that is what they have been doing to create makeshift spaces for COVID-19 patients. What we desperately need to do is ensure that we have a separation of assets. Separation of assets means that the physical structure that you use for COVID-19 patients needs to be physically different to the structure used for non-COVID-19 patients. Separation of assets means that the, the, the staff that you use for COVID-19 patients need to not be the same staff that you use for non-COVID-19 patients. Separation of assets means that the equipment, that the PPE, that all of the things that we use for COVID-19 patients should be separate for non-COVID-19 patients because what we are seeing is that the possibility of cross-infection is so high that it is too risky to, to co-mingle everything and it is too risky for us to, to, to have everything together because we run the risk of contaminating all of our resources. We run the risk of contaminating the entire hospital. We run the risk of, of having our healthcare professionals because they are moving from COVID-19 to non-COVID-19 patients. We run the risk of them having cross-infection happening. And that is what we can't do. Tobago has the benefit right now of hindsight is 2020, looking at the mistakes of many of the other countries who have been hit really hard. If we do not act now and if we do not do it correctly, we will run the same risk and we would have to then deal with the consequences of not dealing with this properly. That is something that we simply cannot risk. The size of Tobago is too small for us to risk that. That was the first thing. The second issue that I wanted to raise was for us to again rethink this idea of transporting our severely injured or severely sick COVID-19 patients to Trinidad via the Coast Guard vessel. Now, I heard about this several, uh, a week or two ago, and we haven't heard anything about whether this is still the plan or not. If this is still the plan, we need to again reconsider this because we have to look at several things. Coast Guard vessels, are Coast Guard vessels built to take that kind of, those kinds of patients? Would the Coast Guard vessel have the necessary equipment? What if the patient that we are transporting needs to be ventilated? Do we have ventilators on the Coast Guard vessels? Do we have portable ventilators to go with the patients on the Coast Guard vessels? What if the patient is an immunocompromised patient or the patient has some other comorbidity? Maybe they have kidney failure or something else. Do we have the equipment, the portable equipment, to go with them on the Coast Guard vessel? Because obviously the Coast Guard trip the vessel, the, the trip on the Coast Guard vessel is not going to be a five minute trip or a 10 minute trip. My understanding is that it takes several hours and we have to ensure that our patients are safe in all circumstances. We need to ensure that they are taken care of and we need to ensure that putting them on the vessel does not put them more at risk than if they had stayed here. This is why very, very early up, I started speaking uh, a lot about ensuring that we are able to treat COVID-19 patients here in Tobago. Because if, heaven forbids, the situation gets out of hand in Trinidad and they have to fill all of their COVID-19 beds, they will not have space to take COVID-19 patients from Tobago. We also have to consider the fact that what if, what if we have four patients today that need to be transferred immediately, 10 patients that need to be transferred immediately. Are we saying that the Coast Guard vessels would have the capacity to do that kind of transfer from Trinidad to Tobago? I am not sure, but it is not a risk that I am willing to take. 
When it comes to crisis management, particularly as it relates to public health crisis management, we need to over plan. We need to plan for the worst case scenario and we need to, to thank God when that worst case scenario does not happen. We should not be planning for the best case scenario and then have to scamper or have to run and have to then figure out what is going on when we have the worst case. This is why from the beginning I've been saying Tobago needs to figure out how we can treat COVID-19 patients here on the island in separate, isolated, designated COVID-19 health facilities. So that was the second issue. The third issue that I wanted to raise was the issue of testing in Tobago. If you've been following me, you know that that is something that I have always been advocating for. We need to have the capacity in Tobago to test for COVID-19. Initially, when we stated, when the Ministry of Health stated that CAFA was the only authorized testing facility, we thought, okay, maybe that would work, maybe we could deal with it, but we've recognized that since then, the Minister for Health has done two things. The first is extending the number of testing sites in Trinidad. The initial plan included having testing sites at the Eric William Medical Complex and testing sites at the Trinidad Public Health Lab. Those were fantastic ideas. And when they said they had PCR machines for those additional centers, I quickly jumped and said, we need to then have a testing site in Tobago. I understand that a site that it was offered. As a matter of fact, I was elated when the, the medical, the, the MCO said that they had offered Tobago all, any and all of the resources that are necessary to do testing in Tobago. He said that they were asking us to look for a PCR machine. If we could not find a PCR machine on the island, they were willing to loan us a PCR machine. He also said that if we needed the technical capacity, the same way the WHO and PAHO and CAFA and everyone else was providing technical capacity to Trinidad, they would have also provided the technical capacity to Tobago. When he said that, I was absolutely elated because this means that the lag time between testing in Tobago would be reduced. If we have our own testing being done here, we would not have to worry about collecting the samples, getting the samples to Trinidad, and then lining up in the queue in Trinidad to get our samples tested. Originally, I understand that the wait time between sending the samples and getting back a result was between a day and two days. I understand, though, that that time has significantly been extended, which means we have a situation where we are testing in Tobago and are not able to get back our results within two or three days. That is unacceptable because when it comes to COVID-19, time is of the essence. Time is absolutely critical. The fact that they have now opened up the lab, as in the private labs, to allow them to be certified or authorized to test was also a wonderful thing. Because I had also stated categorically that even if within our public health system, we did not have the necessary resources to do the testing, we could have partnered with a private lab for them to provide the testing for us here in Tobago. That offer has now been extended to all of the private labs in Trinidad and Tobago. And as a result, I am, since I am hoping that those in Tobago are going to, to, to accept the offer, accept that PCR machine that the Minister of Health offered us, accept the technical advice that the Minister of Health offered us, and let us start testing in Tobago post haste. 
Now, this is critical. This is absolutely critical because we have a situation in Tobago where because of our size and because of what is happening with the cases that we have here in Tobago, as in the confirmed cases, we need to then be very, very careful that we do not have community spread. If we have community spread here in Tobago, it means way more than the two or three or four positive cases that we've identified are actually positive. And those people, individuals who are positive, need to be quickly identified so that we can isolate and treat quickly. This means, though, because of our situation in Tobago, we may actually need to use different criteria to determine who can get tested. Currently, the WHO and therefore CAFA are using symptomatic patients to test, meaning you must have cold and flu-like symptoms to be tested. That is what they've been saying for the longest time. The WHO, though, having, having done some research and having reviewed some of the data that is coming from other countries, are recognizing that a significant portion of the people who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic, meaning they do not show any signs and symptoms of COVID-19, and those people can still infect others. Given our very small size in Tobago, there are only about 60,000 of us, and given the fact that we have had several people come in and we, we have had cross infections happening at various levels, we need to reconsider whether we should be testing using the same criteria, and I personally believe that we should be doing surveillance testing in Tobago, which is identifying people randomly almost, doing at least one test in every 200 people. For 60,000 people, that's only 300 tests for Tobago, so that we could have a better picture of what's happening. We can have a better picture of how many people are actually infected in Tobago. Talking about that part, meaning how many people are actually infected, this is something that has been drawn to my attention and we need to be very clear with this. When the Division of Health, Wellness and Family Development sends out their press briefings, their press releases with updates about COVID-19, the first number that is recorded is the number of tests submitted the number of tests submitted. We would like to have this Division of Health, Wellness and Family Development let us know that of the 70 something or so tests that have been submitted, how many of those tests have actually been done? How many of those samples have actually been tested? Because I'm beginning to get the feeling that a significant portion of the samples that we send to Trinidad are not actually being tested. So we have a significant portion of people who we've swabbed and we do not know their results. Is it that you are calling those individuals and letting them know that your sample was not tested, therefore we do not know your status? Or is it that we are allowing those people to continue thinking, assuming that because they did not get a positive test, that their test result is negative? That is not a risk that we should be willing to take here in Tobago. That is certainly not a risk that we should be willing to take. And because of that, we need in Tobago for them to ramp up testing immediately. If it means partnering with a private lab or ensuring that we have a private lab, then let's do that. We need to call back the Minister for Health and let him know that the PCR machine that was offered, we are ready to accept it now because we cannot, we cannot wait. And because of this, we do not really have a clear understanding of what's happening with our COVID-19 patients in Tobago or with the COVID-19 response.
As I said, these were the three issues that I wanted to raise. The first meaning the need to separate COVID-19 patients from non-COVID-19 patients and not have them be at a single facility. The second being to review our transportation plans for sending people to Trinidad because the Coast Guard vessel is not uh, uh, it's not a viable plan. It is not a plan that puts the patients and even members of the Coast Guard at, at, it's not the best plan for that. And the third thing is we need to ensure that we start testing in Tobago post haste and we need to go beyond beyond the criteria that is being used in Trinidad, that's being used by CAFA, that's even being used by the WHO. We need to go beyond that because what we have in Tobago may be greater if we do not follow it carefully. With that, I would like to open up the Zoom for members of the media to ask questions if there are questions. So we're having, okay, so members of the media, I think we're having some technical difficulties with hearing you. Is it possible for you to send me your questions via text? I see we have, who do we have? We have, I see Liz there and a couple of others. So hold on, Liz, I see that you're talking, but I'm not hearing you. So give us a second, let's figure this out. No, not yet. I'm very good at reading lips. <laughs> So can we pull it up on a telephone? We can, okay. So let me do this. Okay guys, you see this is what happens when you have technology and you're trying to. Hmm? Yeah. Isn't she using her phone? Liz, I'm going to call you on a regular phone. Okay? Liz. Hi, Liz. Thank you. Oh, everybody hearing me now? 
Yes, I have you on speaker on my phone. Yes, they will. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Faith. And in terms of the PDP Minority Press Briefing, what I wanted to know from you, what do you expect any change from the Division of Health with respect to the present situation? Um, I am hoping that there is a change because the reason I'm doing all of this, the reason I've been doing all of the health education, the reason I've been identifying all of this is because we need them to get it right. You see, this is one of those things, Liz, that this isn't partisan, eh? this isn't political. If they fail, Tobago fields. It means that I may need help. It means that you may need help. It means that my mom may need help. And we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow them to fail. So I am hoping that with providing this kind of information that they are able to make some quick, swift pivoting in the plans and we can do this the right way instead of going down the wrong road. When you realized, Dr. Faith, that there was a COVID-19 death, I was not surprised because the statistics pan out that once you have a certain number of COVID-19 cases, there are going to be COVID-19 deaths. Unfortunately, that is part of the, the that's part of how the disease has been working throughout the world. So it was sad, and and I would like to say condolences to the family, condolences to the to the friends of the individual who died, and 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 so forth. But it 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 is expected almost. May I jump in and say one quick thing though as it relates to that. One of the things that I would recommend, because it really, really broke my heart when I saw the wife of the person who died stating that she wasn't able to, to, to say goodbye. And, you know, we, we do recognize that as it relates to COVID-19, we are not going to be able to say goodbye the way we normally say goodbye when there are deaths. What we need to do, though, is to ensure that there is some way of making a connection. So even if she, for example, in future uh, situations, even if the person cannot physically be there. Maybe we need to set up something where we have a, a WhatsApp video call or something like that so that the person, the family members can be a part of the, of, of the ceremony that says, you know, goodbye. And they can do it even if they are not physically there, they can still say goodbye. I think that is something that we can set up. And that's surprising because I was at the, um, the cemetery and um, the gentleman sons and also daughters, they were present at the uh, funeral. I, I do understand that, but if from, from the news report, I recognize that the wife may have also been in quarantine, which means that she would not have been able to come out and yeah. even to go to that. So I mean, in a situation like that, uh, that, that, that we could have made some kind of arrangement knowing uh, that she was in quarantine. One of her legal family members, or sorry, one of the, the sons or daughter should have had um, and you know what? This is a perfect example of we see how it went one time and, and we could figure out how to do it better in the future. Um, well, you know, everything that we have spoken about, the three things that I have highlighted, those are the things that I hope we can make immediately. We can decide that we are not using the Scarborough General Hospital to treat COVID-19 sick patients. We can call the Minister of Health immediately and said, hey, we are going to take that PCR machine and the other resources that you offered for us to start, start testing in Tobago. Those are things that we can do immediately to, to, to turn the tide on how we've been treating with this. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Payne. All right, thank you. So, I think there are no other individuals right now who have no other members of the media. Let me just check in the media chat to ensure no one else posted a question there. No, that, that does not apply. Oh, yes, I am seeing other questions. Thank you, um, Vern from 91.9. Uh, uh, and Vern is asking, um, what gives the impression that person 
person swabs are not being tested and what has happened to make you say this? Or, and the other question is, do you know if there are any PCR machines at private institutions in Tobago? What is giving me that impression? I personally know individuals who have been swabbed and they have not gotten results. And I know if, if that is happening with at least one person, it means it possibly happened with others. And we have to also recognize that it is a question we need to specifically ask. The, 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 um, the releases specifically says, and we need to pay attention to words, the releases specifically says, samples submitted. It did not say samples tested. The releases coming out of the Ministry of Health very clearly say tested and not submitted. So that is why we need to be very, very clear and we need to not just assume that submitted means tested because that gives us a very different picture. If we have, for example, 70 something samples sent and only maybe 20 or 30 samples tested, then we cannot really, really say that we only have three or four or five positive cases because we do not have the test results from several of those samples. Do I know if there are any PCR machines? No, I do not know. And because I don't know, it's one of the reasons we needed to jump very quickly at accepting the PCR machine from the Minister of Health and, and accepting the other resources. Because if it is that there are no other PCR machines on the island, then we should have jumped very, very quickly at the offer and said, thank you, let's take it, let's run with it. By now, we should have been doing testing in Tobago for Tobagonians who need to be tested. I am seeing other questions. And this is from Lois Vincent. Should other patients on the male medical ward be concerned? This is a critical question. Everyone in the hospital needs to be concerned. And this is why. Remember I said before, when we were talking about COVID-19 patients and non-COVID-19 patients, and even in hospitals where they were using all of the, 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 the PPEs and so forth, we still ended up with infections. Remember, we are still learning about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. We're still learning about it. Every day, every week, new information comes forward. We are also recognizing from some of the, some of the statistics that the cases that we have can't be the, all of the cases that are available, meaning the, the individuals who we have tested who are asymptomatic, we, because we've been continually learning more of, about the virus, we recognize that there were actually people who were asymptomatic, who had a COVID-19, who because they were not showing any signs and symptoms, we did not think that they were infective or we did not think that they were passing it on. But when they started doing the modeling and so forth, they recognized that some of the infections that we were getting had to still come from asymptomatic patients. And that is why right now, for example, they're asking all of us to use the face mask because we may be asymptomatic, but because we have not been tested, we don't know that we have COVID-19 and we can still spread it because we are speaking, because we are coughing, because we are smiling, because we are shouting, even because we are singing. And because of that, it means that everyone needs to be concerned. In the Scarborough General Hospital, my understanding is that one of the patients was actually on the male medical ward for some time, and I think they said there were 12 hours were on the ward for some time before they'd identified the fact that that patient had COVID-19. Now that is a real cause for concern because it means that all of the health professionals and even the non-health professionals who were interacting with that patient were interacting with them without knowing or without the necessary PPEs. So the doctors, the nurses, the person who was doing the cleaning, the person who probably brought the, the, the patient's food may have interacted with them and may have contracted the, uh, COVID-19 and then may have gone over to other patients, interacted with them, taken their food to them and all of those things. So yes, we do need to be concerned. Now the other thing that we need to be conscious about is the fact that isolation units 
isolation rooms need to have negative pressure. Now, what does that mean? Negative pressure means that the air pressure inside of the room is lower than the air pressure outside of the room. And because of that, it means that air cannot go from inside the isolation room to outside the isolation room. What we need to ask, particularly at the Scarborough General Hospital, is whether we have negative pressure in the ICU where, the patient, where patients would be, would be dealt with, and whether we have negative pressure in the medical ward. Because if we do not have negative pressure in the medical ward or the ICU, it means that the air from those areas can then go to other parts of the hospital. And that is a cause for concern. That is something that we need to be very, very conscious of. And that is why international standards, the, the, the Ministry of Health, has categorically stated that we should not be treating COVID-19 patients in the main health facilities or in facilities with non-COVID-19 patients. That is very clear. The, I am getting a question from... Okay, let me go through. If there are any other questions, you can post them either in the media chat or send them to me directly. I'm just going through the chat to ensure that I have answered all of the questions. And it seems as I have gotten all of them. Again, thank you. Thank you to the members of the media who tuned in. Thank you to Tobago for, for uh, listening. We are hoping that those with the authority to make some of these tough decisions make them and make them quickly because we do not have the luxury of time. We absolutely do not have the luxury of time as it relates to COVID-19. One, one of the issues that we are seeing all over the world is that when you delay in your response, it allows the volume of people with COVID-19 to multiply exponentially. And we have had the benefit of being a little behind all of the others. And because we have been behind all many other countries, we have the benefit of learning from their mistakes. That is why it's absolutely critical, Tobago, that we, one, do not treat COVID-19 patients in the same facility with non-COVID-19 patients, one, that we figure out another way to, to, to transport critical patients to Trinidad. As a matter of fact, we should be setting up a system here where we don't need to transport any patients to Trinidad at all because we can take care of them here in Tobago. And three, we need to do testing in Tobago post haste. And we need to do testing using our rules and not necessarily the rules as set out by Ministry of Health, by CAFA, by WHO. I encourage all of you to please continue following the recommendations, continue following the social distancing guidelines, continue washing your hands, continue staying home unless you absolutely must venture out. Continue, even if you have ventured out, staying at least six feet, which is two meters away from other people around you. This is the only thing that we can do to protect ourselves. So let us take personal responsibility. Let us take personal responsibility to not continue the spread of this while those who have the authority, while those in the Tobago House of Assembly and those in the TRHA ensure that they take that ensure that they do the writing, that they listen, that they take guidelines, that they follow the examples of other places, or that they don't follow the examples when we've seen Seen the very, very bad outcomes. We, have, we still have an opportunity in Tobago to turn this around, and I am hoping that we do that. Thank you.